Morning. Oh, you can hear me. Brilliant. Uh, welcome uh, to our session, How to Save Democracy. Wow. You know, I thought we'd have a few more because it's important, this, <laughs> but we'll, we, we, we're recording it for uh, Press Gazette, so um, uh, anyone who, who's not here, you can, you can share it with your friends. Um, so, uh, yeah, Dominic Ponsford, Press Gazette. If, you've, if you don't know us, we're the, um, we cover the business of news. We're, uh, according to Press Gazette's own league table, we are actually the most popular website covering the business of news in the world. Uh, on the, on the, on the <laughs> so thank you. That's on the, on the metric we choose, which is uh, similar web monthly visits. That's the, that's the gold standard. That's good. That's the Oscars. I'll buy that. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Richard Cacopolo. You're the, you're, you're the CEO of DMG Media. Should we that's sit right. down? Sure. And we've also got uh, Matthew Scott Goldstein. No, no, who, no, 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 no. Uh, I didn't, I didn't make the picture up there. No. He's, he's, he, he doesn't need, you don't need a... You don't need a, p a picture because you're so famous in New York. <laughs> you're so well known in this city. Thank you, I think. So um, I'm going to bring up, uh, we've got a smaller meteor there. We've got a bigger meteor. Yeah, so there, you are. there you are. There I am, there thank you. Are. There you are. There we go. Okay, so there's the meteor. That's to, that's to focus, our, uh, focus our minds a little bit. So, um, MSG, I'll let you, you're the meteor guy. Can I call you that? Is that okay? I don't want to be the meteor <laughs> guy. I want to be the I have a plan guy. Sorry, sorry. But you're, you're, you, can, you can tell us a little bit about this meteor, uh, that's gonna, whether it's going to wipe us out or whether we're going to yeah, miss so, it a little bit. So but oh, we'll come to that. <laughs> Is that all right? Sorry. Whatever you you've, got, you've got the whole thing there. Uh, we're going to hear from, um, I'd like to hear from you first, Rich, if that's right. okay. So um, you're the... Uh, you know, CEO DMG Media, yeah. so huge print business in the UK, so nearly two million uh, newspapers a day being printed by you, by you guys, a bit less than that. Um, no, but, but for the US audience, uh, you're, uh, again, by Press Gazette's um, unrivaled uh, rankings, you're, you're a top five uh, English language news publisher in the world right. in terms of popularity. Yeah. You're, you're um, you know, huge, uh, <coughs> da dailymail.com. Uh, and the reason we got a picture of Meteor up there, and why, why um, MSG did that piece for Press Gazette, um, is, you know, as we all know, there, there's a couple of big disruptive waves hitting us at the moment. Uh, the cookies, um, and also uh, uh, AI-driven search. And things haven't been great last year for most publishers anyway. Uh, so I think most people have publisher um, ad revenue down 10%, roughly, give or take for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, just f first of all, how's, how's it going? How's, how's yeah. Q1 2024 been yeah. f for you guys? Is, is, it, um, <coughs> uh, is it as horrendous as the meteor, as the, as the picture looks, or, or, or are you still no. kind of able to buy shoes for the children, or, or you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, well, first of all, thanks uh, for, for inviting me to speak, and thanks for attending. Are you sure you don't want to go to the privacy sandbox? Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, no, thanks for giving us an opportunity to speak. I, I usually don't do these, but I think it's important to get uh, some messages out, so I hope to do that today. Um, yeah, our calendar year runs October to September, so we're halfway through the year, and we had a good first half. We're actually up uh, year on year in, in terms of revenue, and. Um, and we, I see a good path for the second half. We have a good team. We are, we've been operating well. I think uh, the, the concern we have is, is really fiscal year 25 or 2025. Um, I think we have some advantages uh, as to why we're able to be successful. One is, yeah, we, we still have a really vibrant print, print business, and that uh, throws off uh, some profit that allows us to invest in the digital initiative. Um, the second thing uh, is that uh, we're really fortunate online to have a huge percentage of our traffic uh, coming direct. People opening up a browser, people opening up the app, and that's always been our focus. Uh, even though there were times when we were, I think in any given month, the biggest on Facebook, I still call it Facebook, or uh, on, you know, on, uh, on other platforms, we always worried about people who came to the homepage, that they were finding content that they found engaging because those visits had more page views and those visits returned. And, and that uh, allowed us to not become dependent on you know, social or search or, or anybody else. So that, that was a big benefit for us. So up year on year, so there's not, not many, uh, certainly not many UK publishers yeah. Yeah. Uh, are saying that at the moment. And you've got mm -hmm. a mixture of, you're, I mean, you're nearly all consumer now, aren't you? Yeah. Consumer media, you've got some events. Yep. 
uh, an events business. Separate business. Yeah, outside yeah. of ours. Yeah, we uh, think we made the right move a few a couple of years back to uh, begin to uh, diversify. I, I liked what Jeff said earlier. And by the way, I, I don't disagree with Jeff very, uh, very many things, so I don't know why Rob thought this would be particularly spicy. But uh, yeah, we, we, um, we still lean into advertising. We still embrace advertising. I think that you have to do other things. And to be good nowadays, to be successful, to be big, uh, you have to do a lot of things. The challenge, you have to do them well. Um, the first thing is you have to produce great content, and engaging content, compelling content, unmissable content, interesting content. Um, and then you have to uh, you know, get traffic from that, and you have to figure out how to monetize it. And we do that well, both direct advertising and uh, programmatic. I think our teams are excellent. And then you've got to probably have some foundational base of subscription or paid uh, reader revenue. You've got to uh, have content that's good enough for, to be licensed. We make a lot of money from licensing our content. And then I think uh, increasingly you have to do commerce well in the way that fits on your site. But what is content nowadays? It's not just articles and pictures, even though we still ingest 100,000 pictures uh, a day and use about 10 or 12,000. Now it's video and it's podcasts. And most importantly, it's not just on your site. We did, we did a, a user group, which we don't typically do, but. Several months ago, we did a user group in London of young people, and uh, they came in, and the typical comment went like this. A guy said, um, one of the younger people said, you know, my, gram, my grandmother loves your paper. She walks down to the newsstand every day, she buys it, she walks home, she makes tea, she changes, turns every page, reads the whole thing. Um, my mother uh, goes uh, on your app all day. Uh, I, I can't get her attention. If my hair was on fire, she wouldn't put it down. She loves your app. She goes, I don't read your paper, I don't go to your app, but I go to your edition on Snap every day, and I love what you do on TikTok. And, and, and we have to realize that. We have to embrace that. We have to figure out how to be, do well on other platforms other than our own in the way that works on those platforms. So what we do on TikTok is different than what we do on YouTube, et cetera. And that's been really important for us. Our revenue streams are diversified. We have to have great teams that manage each one of those, uh, and we do. Okay, I can double source that as well. My daughter's uh, 15, and she she's she's become like the source of breaking uh, news finger on the pulse now in our household because she's on uh, Daily Mail TikTok. So she, you yeah. know, ran downstairs, said uh, Princess Kate's like made this announcement. Yeah. Guys, come on, you need to find out what's going on. So yeah. uh, you know, yeah, it def definitely works. And we're the we embraced it a little bit later, but we're the biggest uh, news publisher on TikTok. Brilliant. But we're not the complacency session. Mm. We are the let's do something about the challenges coming session. Right, so MSG, yeah. over to you. So you, you and I, I, sorry, I playfully called you the meteor guy, but you did a, you did write a piece for us in um, in January, which I know you sent out on your uh, you, uh, to your um, your mailing list, and that inspired um, an article um, in the New Yorker, wasn't it? Which was uh, illustrated with all these. Mm -hmm print dinosaurs being wiped out by... You mean the uh, New Yorker person who took my article, stole it, never <laughs> called me, never referenced me anything, oh. and then I got some texts and emails saying, oh, you're in the New Yorker. I'm like, that's pretty damn cool. Yeah, well, you'll get, you're getting the, you're getting the, uh, getting the, getting the nod now. <laughs> but uh, it, it was quite an influential piece, right? Because it, it shaped a lot of debate and got us all talking. So... so is this the, is this no, the next No, no, go back, go back. Okay. So I've been spend, sending emails out for seven or eight years. Uh, typically four a year, sometimes eight a year when I did the publicly traded company analysis. And the one I sent out about Gemini and how all publishers are in trouble got more attention than everything, anything I've ever wrote. And then you, Dom, republished it, I think verbatim. And then I wrote the follow-up at the end of March, and Rich and I talk a lot about these things. And this was, oh, it's not only Gen AI how bad it is, it's also gonna be Privacy Sandbox. And I went deep into Privacy Sandbox. It took me three weeks to write the email that you then republished and did an amazing job, and now I'm definitely the Meteor guy because there it is, there's a reference again. Uh, and since that point at the end of March, I've had more conversations, and Rich has been in many of them and some people in the room, about the privacy sandbox, what it means, third party cookie deprecation. And it wasn't, here's the end of the world, it all turned into, what do we do about it? And the most important thing is, like, we know it's coming, there's a more of a sense of urgency now than there's ever been, and now you're starting to have conversations and plans about what we can do about it. 
perfect example, we were at a dinner last night. Uh, we have publisher round tables, and now we have publisher square tables. There's 16 of us at a meal having dinner. And there was three direct sellers at the table. And we, we came to the conclusion that the direct sellers are all talking to their agency and marketing friends, and they're all talking about their own particular publishing brand. But they never talk about the power of the open internet and what it means. And that if we could get 10 publishers together, and if they can all start talking about the power of the open internet and communicate that to buyers and marketers and agencies, could that move the needle? And the point that someone made last night as well was, the trade desk has hundreds of people out there all talking the same message about UID and you know, logged in users and to target them. Google and Facebook have thousands of salespeople and people selling the same story. The publisher community has probably thousands of sellers all telling different stories. In some way, we need to get that story a little more consistent. So that is one takeaway that we had, again, from having more conversations than we've ever had before about what can happen in the future. And, and um, your prediction, I think, uh, which, and I don't know whether you, you would concur with this, Rich, is that um, if we don't do nothing, or the worst case scenario, uh, if we th is, um, you know, our, uh, ad revenue could be down, what, 20, 30% <laughs> in, uh, in Q1 2025. You know, it could, be, it could be very, very messy yeah. next year uh, with um, cookies off, although that's been pushed back a little bit, mm -hmm. and with, um, uh, you yeah, know, Gemini completely, you know, you know Gemini, uh, could die, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. LLMs could, you know, they're sort of, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're referral traffic killers, aren't they, potentially? Right, yeah. so the initial data we have right now from some people in the room, even though the you know it's only 1% cookie deprecation out there right now, is that potential CPMs in the Chrome browser, and everyone's not on their head, could be down upwards of 30%, right? But the bigger issue is, and we talked about this before, is if privacy sandbox happens, and if the buyers do not test and figure it out immediately, and then they, gets deployed in Q1 20, 2025 or Q2 2025, and if the marketers and buyers and agencies say, you know something, I'm gonna take a break in a quarter. I'm not gonna buy the open internet this quarter until you guys have it all figured it out. I tried to test, I really couldn't do it, I'm just gonna take a break. And they take all that money and they deploy it to their other you know, digital or, or, or mediums, which is Facebook, Google, retail media networks and CTV, and they take the quarter off and then they come back afterwards at the end of the quarter and they go, guess what? My ROI, my ROAS, based on whatever metric or my MMM my, is looking at, everything's fine. Maybe I don't need to go back and buy the open internet anymore. And that is what we can't allow to happen. Like that is the worst case scenario and there's not a zero probability that happens, which is why we're trying to have so many conversations with as many people as we can to try to come up with a plan so I want to be go. I want to go from the media person to the I have a plan person. Okay. Well, listen, MSG. Thanks for that. We'll come back to you at the end because <laughs> you've got a, you've got a, a brief to uh, leave us leave everyone with hope. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, no pressure. Um, but um, so uh, Rich, the um, DMG Media. You know, yeah. the, to speak to the um, title of democracy and maybe um, yeah. we were actually nodding along to Jeff Jarvis a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, the uh, and I think the the point he made that. Um, you know, we're heading for a world where um, you have an information-rich yeah. elite yeah, right. uh, who may subscribe to the New York Times and the yeah. Financial Times, Times of London, yeah. and then what about the rest of it? And you, yeah. you've, you've got, um, I don't know how many journalists, maybe 1,500 plus yeah. journalists, yeah. Um, DMG Media, huge newsroom, uh, main, most of them producing journalism that's freely available on the open web yeah. that's going to in involve everyone's voting decisions in the big elections we've got this year. But how are we going to keep those guys yeah. and, and gals and women in, uh, in, in jobs? And how are we going to build that, yeah. you know, build that news and not, be, not, how are you going to have a job where you're not, you know, hopefully you're recruiting journalists and not, you know, yeah, we, not uh, having to make them redundant. We, we have been uh, building up our, well, it's a good question. And uh, let's go back to the democracy one. I think President Biden had a good line at the uh, White House Correspondents Dinner this weekend. He said in an age of and I'll misquote it, but you'll get the gist. In the age of uh, disinformation, you know, credible uh, uh, information from trusted sources is more important than ever, which means that journalism is more important than ever. And that's what we believe in, that's what our owner believes in, and that's why he keeps uh, investing uh, in uh, making product and uh, the journalists who, who make that product. So 
we believe that's important. And um, as Jeff said, and he's really quoting a Richard Stengel article, which I thought was great, I think hard paywalls are difficult, are dangerous. Um, we've launched a subscription of a product called Mail Plus. It's a reader revenue premium product in the UK, but it's not a hard paywall. It's 10 to 15 articles out of the 1,000 to 1,500 we do a day that uh, people who want more from the mail can subscribe to. It might be a photo, it might be an article. It tends to not be uh, politics. These, uh, I think that's the thing. We're trying to thread the needle, keep the mass of scale, but also get some reader revenue uh, from those who want more from the mail. The challenge with hard paywalls is just what Jeff said and what Stengel said in his piece, which is we create this two-tiered group. You've got one group that's sort of be, uh, you know, better informed, perhaps more uh, tied to facts, and you have this other one that's this other group that's uh, reading murkier, less uh, reliable information. Um, that's, uh, I think, the goal of journalism is uh, to inform the public. I think an informed public is the foundation of democracy. And if you put a uh, paywall in front of that, you run the risk of not having an informed uh, population. Now that's great. But I think all of us, publishers, advertisers, agencies, regulators, Google, et cetera, need to realize that that is at risk and that a lot of publishers are going to uh, be challenged um, unless uh, things change a bit when it goes back to the media. And so um, I guess just to spicy things up a bit um, from the kind of um, Jeff Jarvis view, which is that, well, you know, Google, they're, they, they've got a better <laughs> business than us. You know, go, go deal with it, guys. Um, if you look at the latest figures in the UK, uh, I think, and Google don't put these figures out so they can contradict me or not, but I reckon they, marketers probably spent in excess of 14 billion pounds yeah. last year on search with Google, right, 14 billion pounds. Uh, if you add up what they spent with every uh, news brand combined, uh, regional, national, magazine, two billion, so seven times, seven times that. Um, and so the, the result of that is that there are probably many, well, there are I know there are many thousands fewer journalists yeah. now, uh, you know, doing that kind of, what, playing that watchdog role. Um, and, and I guess my, what the question I'm leading into is, to what extent are Google, you know, just better? And to what extent is the advertising ecosystem, the plumbing of it all, mm -hmm. a bit broken? Yeah. Uh, and we the kind of- We've got a slide for that. Have we got a slide for that? Um, this, this is the slide. Yeah. Um, this, this is the best slide out there. Yeah, this was, uh, Axios published this slide, and it, um, it, it, it talks to what you were saying. Uh, the, the gray area at the top is publisher display inventory, and you can just see the reduction in share of demand that's going to publisher display um, as they go. And, and as MSG said, the risk is that, you know, if the privacy sandbox or if cookie after uh, cookie deprecation occurs, uh, possible, one might even say likely, that the advertisers say, this is too difficult, it's too confusing, let's just go back. I wanted to buy, you know, I, I'm comfortable buying these other things, buying search, buying social, buying, you know, uh, Amazon, et cetera. Um, the question is, why is that gray area shrunk uh, over the time? And I think it comes back to this question of, of attribution. Uh, and Jeff touched on this a bit. Um, we, as publishers, none of us have ever been big enough to sort of push for attribution, you know, pixel on a thank you page, et cetera. And so what you see today, and we've been seeing this for many years, and, and by the way, in your numbers, that two billion used to be, I'm gonna guess six or seven billion, and it shrunk down, as you can see here. Uh, six or seven billion, uh, yeah, in, in old money. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, like, adjusted for inflation, probably 11 billion, say, uh, in 2007, yeah. 2000, yeah. Before, before the, you know, before the crash, before the economic crash. So why does that happen, right? People buy, you know, advertisers buy Facebook, uh, they put in their dollar and they believe because of the attribution model, they're making a dollar twenty or whatever. They buy Google for 57 cents and they make 72 cents. There's some sense of a return on ad spend. We don't have that. Uh, we have not had that. And that has allowed us, or we've allowed that to um, make our inventory uh, less valuable than I think it is. Uh, we don't get credit for, I think, the, uh, the impact we have. And I understand our place in the funnel is tough. We're, we're not necessarily awareness. We're not necessarily conversion. We're more in that middle consideration range, which is hard to attribute. People come to our site. They know they want to buy vitamins. Uh, they see an ad for vitamins, and they go to Amazon, and they buy it. We, it's tough to credit us. I get it. 
but we have to, uh, I think, um, use this opportunity of uh, cookie deprecation as not just a, a chance to fight back for what we have today, which is a, not a great spot, commoditized, cheap reach. We need to fight for a better uh, representation of the value of getting in front of our users, the user, uh, we shouldn't use users, right? In front of our readers or viewers, um, which is, uh, you know, what we spend so much money to do. Right, so, so think about this scenario. What if there was an internet of tomorrow and there's a new ad unit on mobile? And what if the ad unit was not a little 320 by 50 on the bottom, but more dynamic cargo-like ad unit with a creative that was robust? What if that unit was then deployed across hundreds of publishers across the internet? And what if that ad unit had a conversion pixel on the thank you page of all the marketers? Like that would fundamentally change the way the open internet is looked at. The open internet would get credit, and so would all the publishers contributing to that. Like that's what we're talking about as opposed to the media art. Like there's plans we have, there's ideas we have. I have 100 ideas, probably 85 suck, but 15 might be good. I've thrown out a couple, but hopefully we get enough people behind us to support it, and we try these new ideas to sort of move away from extinction to a better internet. And then what you said, you said the 14, I'm like, it's got to be two. Right? Hopefully next year, in the next two years, instead of 14 and two, it's 13 and three. Maybe it's 12 and four. Maybe we try to reverse this entire trend. Thanks, Philip. And, and, and I don't want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I don't want to bang on about Google. I mean, yeah. the, the um, but you, you, you're, you're actually suing Google at the moment, right? So the, yeah. the, um, the, um, your contention, uh, yeah. well, DM, uh, I think it maybe dates back from before your time as CEO, I'm yeah. not sure, but um, the contention is that um, they're kind of rigging the table a bit, aren't they? Or, they, or historically, they, yeah. they kind of, you know, it's not, not necessarily a fair playing field. And I'll tell you where it stands. Uh, yeah, we filed a, a lawsuit, we filed a suit here in the US uh, against Google in April of 2021. And, um, we claimed uh, that there was uh, market manipulation and some tying of uh, ad product. And um, I think at the time, uh, some people questioned that. But then, I guess next, and, and, and Matt Wiegand's been really the, the key guy on this for, uh, for us and I think for publishers in general, the state attorney generals uh, picked up the case led by Texas. Uh, there are 18 uh, different states joined that case, which is referred to as the state AG's case. Same uh, sort of uh, claims. And then the Department of Justice, it was a short while after that, uh, filed a very similar case. They were joined by seven states, including Virginia. And uh, the trial will be held in Virginia. And, then, and they've asked for a jury trial, because, uh, they, uh, which is interesting, I think. But um, that's going to happen in September. It's been delayed, but it's going to happen in September. Um, on top of that, there are many class action lawsuits. Uh, there are private uh, cases, um, and it's moved across and around the world. The EU now has a private case. The EU Commission is going to determine whether to file a suit like the DOJ. And I think what's most interesting for the conversation today, in the UK, uh, we have the, com uh, the Competitive and Markets Authority, uh, which um, is considering a case against, uh, a similar case against Google as well. In, in sort of running parallel to that, the publishers in the UK asked the CMA to look into uh, privacy sandbox. They call it privacy sandbox, but you get what I mean. And uh, that um, actually is, it seems to be the, uh, the, the thing that's been holding up the rollout of, of, of uh, that solution. Um, I think what's really interesting about all this is um, that uh, the CMA is in sort of an interesting spot. If they choose to go forward with a case uh, or they, these cases play out that question the, um, the whether or not Google has done some things that manipulate the markets. Uh, how can they s say that they want to file the case and at the same time approve what privacy sandbox, which is in many ways gives you know less transparent and gives more control to Google. It seems a tough circle to square or whatever you, you want to say there. Um, but we'll see uh, these things. These rulings will start coming down. The case will play out in September. It, it'll go fast. Um, if Google is found uh, guilty of some of those things, or uh, then I think one there'll be damages for. You know, we'll all try to claim damages, arc, um, and then um, you know there will be some changes, whether or behavioral changes or structural changes. So, yeah, it's been it's taken a long time, but I think 
it's uncovered um, some practices that we thought might be occurring. Okay, well, we'll watch that mm. with interest. Um, I'm interested with this idea about um, us publishers maybe um, not being our, you know, not being our own worst enemy in a way mm. by allowing our our product, the main thing we sell, uh, you know, advertising, mm. to become commoditized. Because yeah. you guess when, you know, 2007, oh, happy, happy days, although I was, I was working at a local paper in those days, earning no money. They mm. oh, it wasn't going to me, but um, the, you know, this, this 14 billion in today's money, you know, that was, that was people out on the road uh, making their pitch, saying how proud they were of the Daily Mail, of its readership, of its mm -hmm. wonderful journalism, of uh, you know your opportunity to appear here as an advertiser, mm -hmm. and then we sort of went from that to a kind of um, pilot high, sell it cheap, mm -hmm. um, and you know yeah. see what happens. You know, it, it, can we explore that a bit more? This commoditization of advertising, and how, where we went r wrong, maybe, and how we can mm -hmm. maybe think about fixing it. Yeah, Rich and I were talking about this the other day. That if you reinvented the ad-supported internet today, it would be nothing like it, what it ended up becoming, right? Uh, and it's just a shame that it's going down this path, but maybe with Privacy Sandbox and maybe with all these conversations, we can sort of turn. If you want to go to the previous slide, I can actually do a, there it is. So this is the, it's a lot in there, but this is the third party cookie Privacy Sandbox update. Right, so number one, unprecedented challenges as we talked about now for the publisher industry. There's chaos everywhere, it's a mess, but at least conversations are happening. Publishers, as we said before, don't want advertisers to stop buying the open internet. That is probably one of the most important takeaways we can have today, they have to continue to buy. Uh, Google's deprecating third party cookies, and as you were saying before, Dom, one of the worst things that could happen if Google did not do Privacy Sandbox and they just got rid of all third-party cookies, right? Then you're Safari-like and then CPMs go down even more significant and might be game over. So the fact that Google is trying to figure out third-party cookies with Privacy Sandbox is a good thing. It just needs to have to be figured out the right way. Uh, measurement and attribution is more important than targeting no matter what. If you can't measure, it doesn't count. Google and Facebook both have their own measurement. They have the pixels on the thank you page. They know what's going on. They judge their homework, and they do it extremely well. The publishers are at a disadvantage. We do not have those measurements. Uh, Google said it's not going to be Q1 20. It's not going to be in 2024. We all knew that. We predicted Q1 2025. It's probably going to be, raise your hands, Steve Mummy, Q1 or Q2, right? But we have to plan for Q1 or Q2. We can't keep. The worst thing we can do is keep on pushing it back. As you push it back, then there's less of a sense of urgency for the marketers, and that's not good. One of the most important pieces is testing. There is such limited testing happening right now with Privacy Sandbox. Like, we know the Yahoo DSP is testing it. We know Criteo's testing it. We heard the Washington Post is testing it. We know Amazon's testing it. And there's probably three or four other publishers testing the Privacy Sandbox, and that is it in the ecosystem. And that is not enough. We need more and more testing, even with the 1%. Uh, and then, most importantly, in the last one, and we also, we, 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 Rich and I forgot about this, and then JR, John Roberts from Dot Dash Merits brings it back to us every time we talk to him, and thank you for hosting this, that a functional privacy sandbox has to be sustainable for addressability and measurement for marketers. The marketers have to say, yes, I will use this. Yes, it works. Yes, I like it. It is not a tax. They will use it. And if that doesn't happen, if marketers don't use it, then the publisher industry is in trouble. So I just wanted to get all that out there because it's a, it's a nice okay. little we'll recap leave, of what's happening. We'll leave that up there. So it's not as good as what Paul Bannister does, but it's half decent. There's no laughs at all in this no, crowd. Absolutely. Come on, John, laugh at that. It's because. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let, let's go. Let's go to the other meteorite. Right? Um, maybe that's not. Maybe it's a same meteorite. Right? That's another one, really, isn't it? The um, generative AI. Mm -hmm. So you're a bit further along in the USA uh, with that already, with Google rolling that yeah. out. Um, oh, it's the. As we show, yeah, what you saw today when you did a query, you got an answer back and not the. Well, I, well, I, I queried something that I know Press Gazette's strong on, yeah. which is uh, um, 
conversion rates, right. publisher conversion rates, right. from for su publisher subscription conversion rates, because right. we're, we're the only people that write about that, right? So we, yeah. so and then I was, I was amazed to see Google, Google, the first page of results. And if I searched that in the UK, I would get Press Gazette snippet, Press Gazette link, here you go. If I search for that in the USA, yeah. I get um, Google has written as an AI generated article right. based on Press Gazette, right. which is about two pages long. If you scroll down or you burrow into it, right. you could somehow find the Press Gazette link. So you but didn't. you know, I just feel like to you use an analogy. You didn't like that. You didn't like they they yeah, stole yeah, your yeah. they stole your content, right? Yeah. I feel like I feel like the Google has basically let itself into my house yeah. and made a nice lunch from the best you know pastrami in my fridge. <laughs> And you know, left the plates out for me to do the washing up, and left the door open. So that's the, you know, wh wh what's your wh what's your take on that? You, yeah. I don't think uh, DMG's not said yet whether yeah, you're no. going to sue or whether you're going to do yeah. a deal. I no. mean, I don't suppose you're going to answer that no, now. Yeah, <laughs> but what, yeah. what's your? Are you concerned about that? You know, yeah, I think I think everyone is is rightfully concerned, and I I think it's a very complex question, and we haven't um, stated uh, our opinion or our direction just yet. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that it's uh, multifaceted. I think there's questions about the value of the content being used as input. There's value of the content being used as output. I think that the LLMs, the, the, the OpenAI and the, the Google, are, are a one model. I'm worried a, a bit, too, about what I'm calling the second level, um, which is more of the, just the pure scraping and the real-time scraping, uh, which um, we're seeing a lot of investment in there. We're seeing a lot of... Uh, of, of uh, apps that are being created or solutions that are doing much of what you saw. Um, we're, not, we're not taking the lead on this one. Um, I do think we're really fascinated by the New York Times case and we think it was an excellent case. But I think it's important to also realize that, the, and I'm uh, speaking for the Times and if I'm wrong they should correct me, but I think it's more than just payment. I think the Times have been pretty open about uh, what they want here is also a clarification of what copyright means in this day and age, and two, what happens if the content is used in a way that somehow harms your brand. So look, this is a long game. I think um, uh, it's, it, there, are some, uh, uh, there are some landmines to step on if, if you go down the path incorrectly. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're having a lot of meetings. We're, having, we're getting as smart as we can be. We're doing research, but um, we haven't signed any deals yet. I'm going to just see if I'm going to plant the seed. If anyone's got a question, uh, we're happy to take questions. So just just think about that for a second. But you don't have to. Well, obviously not not compulsory. Um, in terms of the, I'd, I'd just love to. The, it's really useful to hear about things that are working, things that are going well. Yeah. Uh, you said the revenues yeah. up at the moment, so yeah. great. Yeah. What are the things? What are your growing revenue streams at the moment? Yeah. What are the things that are, are working? Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, yields are up. I think everyone knows yields are up, and some of the new ways of uh, targeting probabilistic ID, deterministic ID, are really working um, well for us around the world, um, uh, and that's important. And and I think that plays into the question of what what happens after cookies, right? Uh, I think there's not going to be one solution. I think um, privacy sandbox is not going to be the only solution. I think there are going to be a lot of uh, different ways of of um, accessing demand or ways that demand are going to want to connect with supply. Uh, one of them is contextual, and I, I, I think uh, there's a potential for some uh, publishers in, in contextual, and I, I think our hosts here are probably leading the way. I have a few concerns about contextual. I think one is if it was going to be the answer, there'd be a lot more testing done, and, and I'm not seeing that just now. Of course, Amazon could change that uh, pretty quickly. Uh, but the second one is bigger for us. Is, uh, it's very hard. Um, I don't think it works well for news sites. It's hard right now to... Uh, you know, to run any contextual ads on stories about Ukraine. Uh, you know, a lot of, you can't sell a trip, uh, the travel doesn't work well on there, for example. So it's hard to uh, monetize news through contextual. That said, I think contextual uh, signaling is an important aspect, among others, of uh, defining audience segments. And I think that's what we need to be looking at, is how we sell access to the audience in a, um, across those, uh, you know, audience segments or, or data segments ar around who that is, which to us is really the big thing because we're looking for 100% addressability, which, uh, you know, we don't have today um, with uh, Safari, et cetera. And I don't think uh, we want to go down the path of having it all keyed off of email because that's going to be a small percentage for many people. So 
Uh, contextual will work for some. It may work on some of our channels or some of our content categories. But for news publishers, I don't think it's, it's going to be the sole answer. And in the end, we're going to have to have a lot of pipes open. It's going to make it very hard for smaller publishers to manage, um, you know, optimizing uh, the, uh, the matching of supply with demand. Yeah, so co and contextual, just for those who aren't in deeply into it, but it's, it's the, the idea that, you know, you you're read an article about uh, cake baking, so you yeah. go out and buy a cake, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully you would think that if you can track that reader, then yeah. that person's also interested in Gaza and other things right. in Ukraine, and maybe you can still serve them, yeah, s hopefully. serve that person right. ads there. But yeah, we get, you know, sports fans who are interested in, you know, in, in travel, or you can get, you know, yeah, we're looking for those audiences. And when we've done some testing, particularly in the UK, on those targeted audiences, we've seen great, uh, you know, effectiveness for advertisers. So we, we're really leaning into that, and um, I, you know, I, I think that's going to be one of the, the bigger solutions. Um, you know, what's working? Uh, video's working, and you know, we're a little late uh, to video, to be honest with you. Um, I just I don't think we did what I said. I don't think we understood that some of our we didn't realize how to tell stories the way, you know, our journalists have done for 130 years in video. But I think we're getting there, and that for us because we're late in a weird way, a lot of that video revenue for us is incremental year on year, um, and that you got to think of it whether we like to admit or not, YouTube is is going to be. Um, I mean, they just posted extraordinary earnings in the Google earnings. They're going to be sold out in the election. And in a post-cookie world, I think more, let me go back to that Axios slide, more and more money will move to, to YouTube. So I think the fact that we can take our storytelling, our content creation, and, um, and get it uh, in the form of video and get it onto YouTube for us has been incremental and will continue to be incremental. And Rich, what about e-commerce? Yeah, e-commerce is uh, probably our best performing line right now. Um, I think we've really figured out uh, that voice and how to uh, recommend products or talk about products. Um, and uh, yeah, that's 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 been uh, really good for us. Um, direct sales have been solid. Uh, yeah, so uh, things are working right now. I mean, it's there are a lot of challenges coming up in the second half. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, potholes, but I think you know we've always found ways to manage through that, and uh, and I'm very confident that our team will do that. Um, as I'm confident that the urgency of uh, the deprecation of cookies is now sort of. Um, or the issues with that are, are creating an urgency of that, I think the industry will move to resolve. And you've, and we, you've got that print business. We should probably mention that quickly, because yeah. the, um, you know, in the UK, yeah. uh, probably 1.8 million yeah. copies a day, one Metro, yeah. Daily Mail, Metro's I. Metro's million one, yeah. Yeah, so it's, 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 a, there's, you know, it's a big business there, but obviously, yeah. you know, anyone who sees the, uh, and you guys still publish yeah. your ABC figures. We do. So hats off to you, because yeah. not many, lots of people are a bit embarrassed and they keep them secret. Uh, we're the biggest paper every day. Um, we still, I think it's amazing, we still sell 1.2 million physical copies of the Daily Mail on a Saturday. It's, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, we, we print 1.1 uh, million, I think now, of the Metro every day, the I, et cetera. It's, uh, it's, it's, there is an audience for print uh, newspapers there. It's a declining business though, isn't it? Yeah. So is that, is that a headache? Is that, is that a concern, the 10, 20% um, yeah. at, at attrition every year? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's closer to 10, and it's, um, it's not a matter of whether we're doing better than The Sun or The Telegraph or anything like that. It's more the concern of when newspapers as a platform become less important to advertisers. That's, that's what we try to work on, and again, I think for the first time we're starting to, um, th there's, uh, it, it was very much a zero sum game. You know, you bought the Telegraph as a reader, you didn't buy the, the, the Daily Mail, you bought the Daily Mail, you didn't buy the Sun, but I think now we're starting to work, um, as, as we do in digital, but in print too, to find ways to work together. And I think, um, you know, and to try to uh, keep delivering a great product to uh, the readers um, who are getting older. Well, I'm going to give you one last question in a sec. But just have we got any? Uh, would anyone like? We got a question down there. Just if you wouldn't mind, uh, have we got a microphone? Oh, we yeah. have. Let's know, let us know who you are. And we should have planted. Oh, uh, we know who Danny is. Come on. <laughs> Not a planted question. Um, so I'm Danny from Ozone. Um, Rich, you opened up by talking about uh, TikTok, and you yeah. also referenced YouTube. Yeah. Um, in a world where your content is increasingly distributed yeah. uh, outside of your domain, um, your core domain, yeah. um, how do you? How does your team think about? Uh, the monetization of that? Is there a framework yeah. Um, yeah. that you've got that approaches that? 
what's working yeah. well and also what, where are the challenges? Well, we, uh, th there is it varies by, um, by the partner or the platform. Like we've been a partner with Snap since the early days. And uh, we, that was actually one where we moved quickly. We're, we don't often move quickly, but we were in, um, we had an addition in, uh, on Snap uh, Discovery from the beginning in all regions. Um, that's been really uh, important for us, uh, both in terms of revenue, but also in terms of introducing the brand uh, to an audience. Same with TikTok. I, 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 very, I really enjoy uh, seeing the comments on our, uh, our, our stuff on TikTok about you know, how they didn't know about the brand here maybe, or how we really sort of define the brand for that audience. Again, figuring out what works um, uh, on that platform. Uh, so it, it varies. Uh, sometimes uh, we distribute content and they drive uh, traffic back. Um, and sometimes we distribute it and they take the responsibility for monetizing it. Um, MSN's working really well for us right now. We have a great team that, uh, that manages that relationship and, and has figured out to make it uh, work for both parties. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different on each one, but sometimes it's branding, sometimes it's traffic, sometimes it's licensing. Uh, but in all cases, it's, um, you know, can we tell can we produce content that tells a story that is, um, is, is, is compelling and interesting? And I, I think that, that's, a, I mean, you go back to this, I, I think a point we didn't make before is, um, and I'm sorry to spam you into this, but I think it's important to note that Google and regulation and all those things, they're not gonna bail us out. They're not gonna be what, um, know, is a solution for what we do. And quite honestly, it shouldn't be. I mean, it shouldn't be that governments control. I mean, if you think about it, again, a, um, the, the role of, of, of journalism uh, it should be to inform the public. And it should allow the public to make informed decisions. And it should allow the public to uh, question their elected officials. And it should allow the public to hear differing opinions. And if um, that's influenced by the government or that's influenced by platforms, I think that that, that is really at risk. So. That's not the way we're going to get out of this. But I think if we work together, we work with partners like the Snaps of the world and the MSNs of the world and, and YouTube and, and others, I, I think we can figure out a way to get that content that we create to be appreciated. And if we can come up with attribution for when we run it on our sites or we run ads on our site, then I think we can make enough to cover the very high cost that we pay to generate this content. So that's the hope. Any other questions? Uh, David from News Corp. I know part of your piece, MSG, was about uh, setting up a working group that I believe, Rich, you are a part of, and, and Brad from the New York Post is as well. Right. Can you maybe talk a little bit about some of the conversations that have happened, um, the content, uh, the questions you're grappling with? You want to go on? I, I always like to let MSG take this so that if people don't like it, I can blame him. <laughs> so, so we had a meeting on April 12th. As we talked about in the in the in the note we sent out, uh, we had 24 people show up to the meeting. There were 12 to 14 publishers, and there was six, seven, or eight non-publisher people, and we had a phenomenal conversation. And it was a two-hour Zoom. Uh, and then afterwards, it took me a while, but I came up with a list of 12 things we can do together and 12 things we can do individually. And I'm going to send this out in a week to everyone so they can see it. Now, part of the problem is, and I was thinking about this, I've written more in the past five weeks than I probably have in the last few years. And every time I write something, I go back and I look at it, and it's outdated because things are moving so quickly, right? But some of the things we can do together, or there's a bit, some of the things we do individually is, you know, uh, continue to produce great content, get your DMP in order, talk to the agencies and advertisers and gather feedback. Uh, make sure your CEOs of your company understand what's going on, right? So in the meeting of 24, there were three or four C CEOs. There were four people who report, report directly to CEO, and there's some lower-level people. If the CEO doesn't understand what's happening and really verse in everything that's happening now, it's much harder to move the needle, okay? And then there's stuff we can do together. I wrote a, or Matt Wheatland and I wrote a, Publisher Declaration of Relevance. It is not good, but it's a start. And it's, you know, what everyone, 
from direct sales can put into their deck so the buyers see it and this is why you buy the open internet. So we have all these lists and we're gonna send them out and try to figure out if we can move the needle. And we're gonna have another meeting next Friday and hopefully uh, my friend Mark Willie from Google can pop in there. Uh, Tony Katzer is gonna, is gonna right. pop in there. I'm just trying to open it up to as many people and get as many fresh ideas to try to come up with an idea. And again, like I said, if I have 100 ideas, 85 will suck. There might be five or 10 that are good that we can actually use. I think the, the message for today is uh, this is not the time to go it alone. Yeah, there are things we can all do in, independently. As I said, we'll lean in more to the, our audience segment for selling that direct, uh, for example. And we are uh, completely open to some of those segments being translated into segments that can be bought in the open market. IAB taxonomy is a great. Um, things we can do together, this is not, the, uh, you know, it, it, this is, there's value in working together. There's value in agreeing on uh, common terminology. I think if we, and one of the things that's really important and I urge everyone is to test uh, privacy sandbox. I, and to make it as viable as it can be when it does launch. Uh, what we don't want is, is uh, buyers, much like during GDPR, just moving to the sidelines a little bit. We all forget GDPR was what, five years ago? It was a mess, and some people really played it badly, and they were very hurt by it. And uh, we want to avoid that this time, and I think that's just by communicating and working together on things that we can, uh, that we can do to make privacy sandbox as viable, if that's a word, a, as it can be. I'm, I'm, I read the Google announcement uh, that it wasn't just that they were delaying. It was that they were also open to addressing some of the concerns that many uh, people have raised, including uh, the IAB Tech Lab. So I think we work with Google. I think we work together. I think we work with agencies. Uh, Danny's been really a, a big advocate. I think we work with the buyers and the agencies on figuring out how we give them the clean signals they are gonna want to do buying. So it's really just a call out of let's keep communicating, let's keep working together. And then one thing to add is, like I said in my last bullet point, the buyers are the most important people. We need to convince them, and unfortunately, they're not in the room, right? When we had our conversation, I had a buyer and agency people who couldn't make it, so it's really hard to get in front of them, but we have to get in front of them with consistent messages, not 50 publishers saying 50 different things. It just creates too much confusion. And I think we said we, we, said we try and let, um, end on a bit of hope, so I'll leave that, I'll leave that to you. Rich, to, to, prov to provide some hope. Have we, have we got a hope slide? There's a slide. There's a hope slide. I thought MSU was doing No, go, go, go. Yeah. There is hope. All right. I think we've said almost all these things, but there is hope. I mean, I think w we'll leave a slide up there. And I, w I, just, I, feel, I feel like, and I don't know whether people have always been saying this year after year, but I feel like maybe we're at a, we're at a point now where if we get it right, yeah. we could um, set the framework in That's place right. for, you know, maybe a generation, right, right, of... of profitable right. you know, journalism. Are you, are you hopeful yeah. that we can do that? Well, I, I think we have to start by saying, let's not just be content with fighting to keep the spot we're in right now, which is commoditized, cheap reach. That's not a, um, where I think the value of, of getting in front of our audiences are not uh, accurate. Um, that was something, and Jeff referred to it, I was, uh, remember we, we made some mistakes early on that allowed it to get commoditized. And, um, but now maybe the, the, the confusion or the, 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 the sort of the, the, the urgency that, that's um, uh, happening now may be the also the opening for fixing some of those things. And I think if we can get some of those past sins rectified, yeah, I think we could be in a better place for the next generation. It's gonna be a tough year. Um, I think, I'm not sure everyone will make it through, um, but I think if you can get to the other side, it would, I do see a, a role a, a world where it would be better for publishers and advertisers and hopefully readers as well. Great night to can finish can I, can I, One more? Yeah. One more. So Rich and I together have done about 30 publisher roundtables in the past seven years. I would say in this year, 2024, we're gonna have 30 formal conversations just this year, bringing people together to have more of these conversations. And that's like unprecedented, because again, we can't do it together, we need support from everyone. Okay, well, everyone get in touch if they want to. With MSU. Yeah, with MSU, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they want to find them yes, Listen, uh, thanks very much to um, Be The Tech for hosting us. And uh, yeah. thank you, Richard thank and you, uh, MSG for. Thanks uh, for attending. And yeah, thanks for. Rob we get some applause now. Yeah. 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 Cool.